Good evening all, and welcome. This video has been graciously sponsored by Skillshare. Make 2020 a year where you explore new skills and deepen existing passions with Skillshare's online classes. It's an online learning community with so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives. These can include anything like photography, how to record audiobooks, YouTube videos, and so much more. I personally have been enjoying Poi Spinning Classes by Ben Drexler, and if any of you guys are interested, I really recommend you check it out. Not to mention, at less than $10 a month, it's incredibly affordable. And just for you guys, the first 500 to click the link in the description will get two free months of premium membership. So go on, click it, get two free months and broaden your horizons. You won't regret it. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This story takes place when I lived on my old property. I was a little boy, maybe eight or nine. You see, the cul-de-sac I lived in was a fairly nice neighborhood, nothing crazy. My room was across from my parents, just down a long hall and next to my sister's room. My brother and I shared rooms and a bunk bed. Everything was fine until my sister reached her teen angst phase. Then came the doll. It was a creepy looking porcelain doll with a black tutu and had a punk rock kind of motif and she loved it. She got it from her godmother, a woman we no longer speak to. My brother and my mum and I never liked the thing because it gave us the creeps, but hey, it was her doll. However, slowly but surely we began to see a change in her. She was beginning to become more reclusive and angry with my mother for no reason at all, and even cut herself in front of me once. Weird, yes, but nothing quite supernatural. Then she began to sleepwalk. At first, we thought it was normal, maybe just stress from being a teenage girl. I don't know. But she started to creep me out. And because of this, I began to lock the door at night after my brother fell asleep. And on one of these nights, I heard her get up from her bed and slowly walk. I was in my top bunk, mind you, watching under the door when I saw her shadow. See, as my room is across from my parents, I couldn't tell if she was standing there in front of my room or my parents, but it was still very creepy. And she stood there for an unnatural amount of time. On the last occasion, we all awoke one morning to a knife under my parents' bedroom door. And this just made them flip out. They weren't scared. They were more concerned about my sister being nuts and homicidal since she'd been acting so strangely. Things went on for a little bit until one day the doll disappeared and my sister came out furious huffing and puffing, but no one in the house seemed to have an inkling about its disappearance. And so life went on and I never knew what happened to it until I asked my dad about it years later and he enlightened me. It turns out that my godmother was heavily into black magic and Santeria, and had a deep hate for my mother over some petty squabble they had before my father and mother were married and held a deep resentment for her. I guess firstborn females of the family is important in Santeria. And so when she saw an opportunity, she gave my sister that horrible doll we hated. But what actually happened to the doll was the funniest part. My mum is super religious, and I guess at some point she had soaked the doll in holy water and left it in the trash for the garbage man to take out to the dump the next day. Another funny thing, my sister never sleepwalked again. When I was between the ages of seven and 10, I lived in a house in a small town in Missouri. Nothing was abnormal about the house, I mean, normal house settling noises, which would cause me to have nightmares frequently, until this incident that I will begin diving into. The only weird thing that ever happened was our keys going missing. When you walk in the door, there was a giant metal wood stove that we put our keys on. They went missing for weeks. We destroyed the house looking for them, and one day they just reappeared and nobody knew where they came from. Anyway, there was a doll back when I was younger called an Amazing Grace doll. She had holes in her ears so she could hear you and would turn her head 
where the noise came from and would say, Mama. Well, I loved this doll. I explicitly remember cleaning my room and propping Grace against the wall so she was sitting up. I lay down on my bed to read when I heard the clicking she would make when her head turned. So I looked up and stared at her and got the normal Mama she would say after she heard something. So I tossed my book down and picked her up to make sure she was turned off. She was. I flipped her switch and then flipped it back to off, thinking that it was a normal malfunction. I set her back in a spot and plopped down to continue reading. When I started, she said mama again. So I went and took all her batteries out. I was over it at this point, so I just tossed her on the ground and went back to my spot. She started clicking quicker and her head was moving back and forth and she just kept repeating mama. I took off, I ran to get my dad and he saw it and decided that we would burn the little doll. We did, but nothing happened again to my recollection, but my nightmares got worse. And this was when I was still religious, so I would put all my stuffed animals around me in a circle to protect me. I had a turquoise dream catcher and would pray every night for the nightmare to go away. They didn't until we moved. They weren't every day, but definitely several times a week. I am a collector of vintage and antique items, including mid-century fashion dolls. I usually purchase them from thrift stores, estate sales, or very occasionally on Craigslist. Recently, I purchased a group of 1960s Barbie dolls that were a real bargain. I know the woman had a great knowledge of vintage dolls since she used to sell them on eBay, so she knew what they were worth. Still, I didn't question why she was selling them at such a low price. I was delighted with said purchase and couldn't wait to fix them up for my collection. A few days later, my bedroom suddenly became infested with flies. It was absolutely insane how many of these dirty little beasts filled my room. They seemed bent on driving me mad as they were constantly buzzing in my face or landing on or over me. Some folks say that flies are a bad omen that signify the coming of bad times. These flies were of plague-like proportions and were also a true enigma of why they arrived when they did. Around the time, I became very ill with flu-like symptoms. The weirdest part of this illness was a strange feeling like my brain was burning. I also experienced severe headaches that included crazy brain fog that felt like torture. It's hard to articulate exactly what the feeling was, but I've never experienced such an odd feeling in my head. It was so intense that ending my life crossed my mind. One last oddity to add to the pile. Usually I'm a very vivid dreamer with dreams that always have the same basic elements. After the purchase, my dreams have become dark and muddled. When I wake up, I feel exhausted as if I haven't slept. So why did I equate these mysterious happenings with the recent purchase of the dolls? I know it's not entirely logical, but it's just a strong feeling I have. What should I do? Could an inanimate object be cursed or bring bad luck? Maybe that's why she sold them for so cheap. I just want to add that I do not practice the occult nor believe in ghosts. The reason being is that after my father passed away quite recently, I saw no sign of him. My best friend also ended his own life some years before that, and I felt that if I were ever to experience a spiritual visit, he would have given me some sign. I just want to believe, but I can't. My brother used to live with our aunt for a few years. My youngest cousin, who was a little girl back then, was made to share a room with her older sister, so my brother could use her room. My little cousin's room was filled with dolls of all shapes and sizes, as in the only space in the room without one was the bed and a few steps leading to it. As expected, this creeped up my brother all the time, and he would take his time to reposition them in a way that their backs faced him instead. But without fail, every time he woke up, all the dolls were facing him again. He said there were even three or four dolls 
that always, always ended up sitting beside his head, even if he had put them away in the cabinet or locked them out of the room. At first, we tried brushing it off by saying it couldn't have been our cousins playing a prank on him, until it went on even when he was alone in the house for days. He got so used to it, it didn't bother him anymore after a few months, as it happened to him until the day he moved out two years later. My aunt and cousin said they'd never experienced anything remotely weird in that room, so it was clear they had a preference for my brother. Because of my general interest in horror, and because they were appealing to me for a while, I collected dolls. It didn't matter what type. I had some porcelain ones, some pretty looking horror movie level dolls, that sort of stuff. They were generally creepy to the majority of people, and of course, they're haunted, was a joke that I often had. But I never had an issue with any of them. In fact, I thought they were all comforting. They all had names, and I had a history of picking them out, usually from antique shops, but I had two or three from a house sale after the owner passed away. On October 28th, 2017, my parents were out of town, so my brother and I were home alone, and my dad sent me a picture of the coolest doll they found at this church thrift shop. The doll was the epitome of everything I liked. I loved clowns and circuses, and the soft pastel colours were my absolute favourite, so much so that I was writing a story at the time that reflected these interests. The doll was perfect, it felt like it was for me, like in that Coraline sort of way, but instead of looking like me, it was just something no one else could have wanted. In all honesty, I don't think my dad would buy it, but lo and behold, when my parents returned, I had a new doll to add to the collection. This was the first doll that I hadn't bought on my own or personally picked out, but I wouldn't expect it to matter. All of this happened, and I found out more things about the doll. One being that my parents bought it, and the cashier avoided touching it completely. On top of that, they said, Oh, you're buying him. Honestly, that wasn't uncommon. I'd been given a doll for free before because it was in such bad shape. One man's trash is another man's treasure. Having some aversion to a creepy doll was nothing new. Another interesting factoid about this was that my father, who is very strongly a factual person and doesn't believe in ghosts, even the slightest, said he felt this doll before he saw it. To say the least, my mum wasn't happy he went through with the purchase when she found that out. I remember vividly how excited I was to hold it for the first time. I got no negative feelings from it. This was just a doll. I do remember that one of the first things I noticed was his lack of eyes. I figured it was an old one, and the eyes had fallen out. If anything, it just made me like him more. The creepy clown doll, who I never named, quickly found his spot on my shelf, and all was well. I don't even remember when I started to get a bad feeling. It started minimally, small things like feeling uncomfortable around them, or that I didn't like them facing me when I was laying down at night. I was never uncomfortable with my dolls, and even when I didn't want to admit it, I wanted to be the weird girl who collected creepy dolls, but all of a sudden being around them made me anxious. I can only explain it as a deep vibrating in my chest that was nothing but discomfort to be in my room. I ignored it for the longest time, but being in that room alone was invoking an anxiety in me that I haven't felt before or since. At some point, I started having progressively worse nightmares, a reoccurring theme that they were never far from real life. In fact, they usually took place exactly where I was at the time, whether it be my bed, the couch, they were where those nightmares would be so convincing, you'd be unsure whether you had woken up or not. I recall two nightmares in particular, one where I was laying in bed. The room was dark, but not so dark. I couldn't see anything. I was laying on my side, facing away from the dolls and towards my closet. The door slowly opened, and there was a really big doll just standing inside of it bigger than people sized. It looked at me, but only its eyes moved. And for a moment, 
That's all I saw before I awoke. This was my first experience with what I can only identify with sleep paralysis, but I don't know if I was actually unable to move or not, or if I was just too scared of what might happen if I did. Of course, nothing was in my closet. It sounds like a cheesy nightmare for sure, but to me this was terrifying. It made it hard to breathe and made my stomach ring. The other nightmare was when I was taking a nap on the couch, and in the dream I woke up, and went to my room. When I went inside, I looked at the dolls and they were moved. Then I woke up again and this repeated. Each time the dolls became more and more scattered laying on the floor or completely broken altogether. Something was moving them. It couldn't have been an accidental nudge before I awoke. It looked like something had angrily shoved them all off the shelf. Eventually I did wake up and the fear I felt as I slowly went to my room was unlike anything I had felt before. I walked as slowly as I possibly could, as if that was going to help with anything. I was just scared of the possibility that they might have been moved. I knew that if I went in my room and the dolls were out of place, something was really, really screwed up. I turned on every light I could. I was visibly shaking with fear, but nothing was moved. It almost felt like I was being mocked. The nightmares continued for a while with no attempts to be fixed. If anything, I just made them worse. Staying awake when I definitely shouldn't have been. Avoiding getting my REM cycle because, due to my research, I found that's when you had nightmares, which I didn't want. I can't remember any other specific nightmare, but a lot of it was just the fear and anxiety that accompanied being in my room. Being near the doll, and how uncomfortable it made me. My dad even said he went in my room to get a pair of headphones and his hip, which has been broken since I was about eight or so, was suddenly full of a shooting pain. And when he left the room, it stopped. It was those small, strange encounters that made it so out of the ordinary. I would do anything to get away from that room when I could, and I didn't even realize it anymore. It was my subconscious telling me that I needed to fear my own space. It was my own subconscious telling me I wasn't safe there anymore, and I usually tried to listen to it. After New Year's is when I put all the dolls away. The night before I had decided to move all the dolls out of my room, I hadn't focused on the fear of any specific one, so I just moved them all out. That same night, I awoke and moved them back into my room. I don't know why, I just felt like they needed to be back. They couldn't be sitting out there. I just needed to move them back in. Apparently that morning I had been acting strangely and eventually my mum and I moved the dolls into a box and into the attic. After I broke down explaining to her how scared I had been feeling about those dolls lately. My mum is a very spiritual person, so she was open to helping me put the dolls away. I haven't had an issue since, but I did do some more research on the doll a few months ago. For a while, I didn't like talking about them or even thinking about them, so I hadn't even looked at pictures of them. These were all things I found out quite a while later. A few things. For one, I finally looked back on all of this, and the one doll that did have eyes. In the picture my father sent me, which I needed to scroll through two years of messages to find, that doll, he had an eye. Of course, it could have fallen out during the drive. I didn't doubt the possibility, but I didn't push the doll's eye out. They were gone as soon as I had them the first time. Maybe it's a coincidence, or I'm thinking about it too much. On top of that, I couldn't find any other dolls that quite looked like it. My girlfriend and I found a few online that looked similar, but they were never an exact match. The colors were all wrong. The face shape wasn't quite the same and I still haven't found any that do resemble the doll. I even tried reaching out to the manufacturers that created dolls that I thought looked like it the most, and assumed maybe there just weren't many pictures online, but I never got a way of contact. All I know is that it still deeply disturbs me when I think about that doll. I'm 22. And as my mom was pregnant with me, my grandfather passed away from lung cancer. 
The only thing he ever got me was this little clown doll that was supposed to hang over my crib. When you pull the clown's leg down, it plays a little music box star song as it winds itself back up. Now I know this already sounds like a cheesy horror story, but let's stick with it. When I was a child, maybe seven or eight, I used to have the clown hanging from the metal curtain tiebacks in my room, probably because I was too young to have read or watched it. But one night, my mom walked up the stairs and in my room while I was asleep, because the clown was playing its song but it had its legs pulled down. Apparently it played for about five minutes and I do remember my mum recording it on her old flip phone and showed me that morning. We actually found out later in the day that on that night, my great grandma had passed away. So my grandfather's mum. My mum is super adamant it was her dad sending some sort of signal, but I'd be interested to know what you guys think. A few years ago, I was reading a forum and a woman said she had a haunted photograph. She said that the picture was taken of her and there was a ghost girl beside her that wasn't there when the picture was taken. More importantly, she said that anyone that saw the photo had bad things happen to them. Naturally, I had to see it. She sent me a link. It was as she described. It didn't look scary to me at all and nothing happened to me. Eventually, I forgot about it. Not long ago, I was looking for something in my messages and came across the link to the photo. I looked at it again and spent probably two minutes staring and trying to look at the ghost girl in detail. Then I closed the tab and forgot about it. Not two hours later, my stepmom calls me to tell me my dad had a polymery embolism. He lived. On his way home, my husband hit a deer and totaled his car. And that night, my daughter got a horrible stomach bug that left us so dehydrated we had to go to the ER. I am never looking at that photo again. I used to do contract security at the emergency room entrance of a downtown hospital, the graveyard shift. I would stand at a kiosk right inside the entrance and monitor access. Across from the kiosk were two sets of elevators. The first elevator on the right could only go up to the third floor. The two floors above us were administrative floors, offices only, no patient areas. So on my shift, floors two and three were closed for the night. The elevator on the left I had to be especially trained to use. It serviced the same floors as the elevator with the addition of a helipad on the roof. This is where life flight helicopters would land with life or death patients that had to be rushed to the emergency room. Security would be notified when a life flight was en route and we take the elevator, use our access key and go to the helipad. On the roof floor, we lock the elevator in the open position so no one could summon it from another floor. The elevator would remain open and in position until the life flight crew had the patient inside and hit the floor one button. Security was not needed to assist the life flight crew. We would take the stairs down as soon as we had the elevator prepped on the helipad. It had been explained to me that the process was important and that people had died on the pad and even during the elevator ride down. I'm not a ghost person. I've never had haunting experiences, but that elevator behaved very oddly. Every night I worked and the right side of the elevator that only serviced the three floors would rest on the first floor. Since it served floors that were not used during my shift, it just sat there on the main floor. I was required to check the second and third floors once a night. Whenever I went to the elevators, I never had to wait for the right elevator to get to my floor because it was already there. The left elevator that serviced the helipad and floors two and three had a mind of its own. All night it would go up and down from floor to floor with no one inside. You could watch the floor indicator for it. It bounced from floor to floor all night 
and it would lower to the main floor, open with no one inside, close, and then go to floors two, three, or five, the helipad. All this activity with no one inside it. The custodial crew was done on floors two and three by 10 pm. Before my shift even started, there was no one around to use those elevators on my shift. On my nightly checks of the floors, I never saw anyone up there. The lights were even off. Not only that, but the left elevator would go all the way to the helipad by itself. You have to have an access key to even have that option. The other guards had no explanation. The hospital employees obviously didn't want to be seen as believing in a haunted elevator and would change the subject or brush it off when I asked why the lift was so weird. But I would watch from the security kiosk all night as that thing would go from floor to floor or shift. It would open up on the first floor across from me and it was always empty. The other elevator that only went to floors two or three never moved unless another security officer used it. About six months ago, I received a haunted doll I bought off eBay. Now I have no idea whether this thing was actually possessed, but the previous owner claimed to have several bad experiences once she purchased it from a garage sale, claiming it smashed into her dinner room set when she was doing her hair in the bathroom. Walking out with a bat to investigate, only suspecting a break-in, only to find not a single sight of anybody or anything, and the dining ware and table was untouched. The next experience she had was when she was getting ready for bed and heard a noise coming from behind the chair. The doll was sitting in and say a dark figure with red eyes glaring at her with anger. Anyway, on to my ownership. When I received the thing, I was fully aware that a possessed object may not show signs of any activity from a few hours up to a few months of being relocated. I never experienced anything. I let it sit on a shelf and collect dust, only remembering it physically exiting my house every once in a great while. I would just randomly think about it, and even when I was doing something completely unrelated or busy at the house. A few days ago, I had lit a burn pile in my backyard to get rid of a bunch of branches and logs, when for some reason, I had the idea to grab the doll and burn it to be done with it. I went back to grab it, and as soon as I touched it, my heart began racing, increasing with every step I took towards my back door. I had finally made it outside to the fire, and tossed it back laying on the fire. Within seconds, it started smoking. As soon as it did, my heart stopped racing and I got relaxed. 30 seconds later, its hair and clothes were in full flames and I watched it as it began to look like something out of a horror movie. The eyes melted and sunk into its ceramic head and it was converted into a charred black soot until nothing but the head arms and legs were left. I let the fire keep burning until all the wood had been burnt. My main question here is whether or not it was a good idea to burn a possessed object. If it is, I don't know what to think about it. Let me know what you guys think about my decision to set the thing alight. This happened about 12 years ago when I was about 11. It was the day after Christmas, and my mum and stepdad and I were sitting in the living room watching TV. It was past 9pm, and my little brother had already gone to bed. Now my brother and I had gotten remote control cars for Christmas, the kind that had rechargeable batteries in both car and remote. As we were watching TV, my car, that had been in the middle of the living room floor, starts making a noise like it's turned on. At this point, all three of us look at it and witness it drive around in circles twice to make a perfect three-point turn, then park up against the wall. We all kind of just look at each other and my mum goes to check on my brother as he was supposed to be in bed. She comes back looking a bit concerned saying my brother is flat out and when he sleeps, he really sleeps 
there's no faking the bear snores he gives off. So she then asks me and my stepdad whether we were playing a prank. We both deny it. My stepdad, even pointing out that the controllers to both cars had been on the side table where my brothers and I left them after playing with them earlier in the evening. My mum proceeds to check both controllers and the cars for batteries. All the batteries were in the charging docks, plugged into the wall, and we had run the batteries out while playing with them earlier. My mum, brother and I had some strange experiences in this house, but this was by far the strangest I have ever experienced personally. I can't think of a logical explanation for this. I've always thought, perhaps, it was a ghost. A number of years ago, me and my boyfriend went on holiday to Mexico. We were looking around the pyramids on one of our tours. And as we're getting back to our hotel, my boyfriend sneaks me off to the side, away from the tour guide, and shows me something he has in his pocket. By his face, he had been itching to tell me for a while. I thought he'd been acting funny. And that's when he pulls out a small rock. I look at it without much interest and go back to hearing the tour guide when he pulls me over again and says, listen, I got this from the ruins. I give him a puzzled look. Why would you do that? I say. I thought it was really cool to have a piece of history with us forever. We can put it in our house. I give him a faint smile. I wasn't really sure why he decided to take a random rock home but I didn't think it was such a terrible thing. Anyway, that night, I had the worst dreams ever. I dreamt that I was seeing my closest friend, Abby, with only one arm. She was trying to tell me something, but it was like she was underwater, frantically waving her arm and stump. And I woke up in a cold sweat and it really freaked me out. I called her up back home but she was still asleep. Figures. I tried going back to sleep, but there was a deep-rooted sense of fear in my gut, and something was preventing me from sleeping with ease. I tossed and turned, and then my boyfriend poked me in the side. I instantly turned and asked him what was wrong. He said he had a horrible dream that my friend Abby only had one arm. This freaked me out a little. I hadn't said anything out loud. Even when I tried attempting the call, I didn't leave a voicemail or a message of any kind. There was no way he could have known or heard me. I brushed this off as a simple coincidence, but for the next three nights, I didn't sleep well, and a general feeling of unease overcame me. We had a few days left of the holiday still, and one afternoon, as I was sitting up in my room, waiting for room service as I wasn't feeling all that well. Did I see a shadow, about half the size of a normal person, dart from our bed to the bathroom? I was reading a book at the time, and I just about crapped myself. I don't move, feeling completely vulnerable. I just stare at the corner where it went towards the bathroom and listen and wait. Minutes pass, and with trepidation, I scoop myself off the bed and look past the corner. There's nothing there, no one to be alarmed about, and I start to get scared. That's when I see the rock my boyfriend took from the ruins. It's just on the glass table in front of the TV, and I wonder, all of this started when he brought the rock. Could it be? I go downstairs to rejoin my boyfriend a little while later and start speaking to him about the rock and asked him what made him want to bring it. He confessed he just thought it was cool and would be something fun to show the lads. I gave him a snort and went to speak with the bartender and get another drink. We started a conversation and I steered it towards culture and history 
and then finally towards the ruins. I wanted to be subtle. Then I said that I heard of the people that took objects from ruins like rocks and stuff. His demeanor changed from the happy, pleasant tone we were conversing in prior. And he looked at me and said, did you take something from the ruins? No, I said, lying through my teeth. Good. They say that those who take from the sacred sites are haunted by a Lucius. I asked him what this funny word meant. And he said that in Mexican culture, they are these tiny dwarf-like spirit things that can drag your soul to the ground and kill you if you're not careful, that they are not to be trifled with. I understood them to be somewhere between a ghost and a bogeyman, but I took his warning very heavily, as I had seen something half the size of a man earlier that day. I told my boyfriend later in the evening that I was having misgivings about him having taken the rock and convinced him that the best thing to do would be to return it. So he begrudgingly agreed and we took the same tour again, albeit with a different tour company to not be suspicious. And he returned the rock exactly where he found it. I'm happy to say the rest of our vacation was spirit free and the feeling of unease lifted. Whether the feeling was in my mind or not is another matter, but I know that I saw that shadow dart from our bed to the bathroom, and it's something I'll never forget. Don't go pilfering sacred sites, people. You never know if you might bring more home with you than you expected. My dad passed away when I was 11. Every summer we went to a little town, which had a porcelain doll museum. I loved going there, hanging out with my dad, and had several dolls myself. But the one I loved the most was one that resembled an Indian girl with two braids. I kept it on a shelf that was facing my bed, pushed it to the corner, and I had it for three to four years. I didn't even touch it, I only admired it. Well, as I mentioned, my father died in December. Fast forward half a year later, it's June, summer holidays, and I'm laying on my bed with my laptop, chatting with my friends at midnight. Both my door and window were open, but it was quiet outside with no wind, and the doll suddenly fell to the floor. I was startled by the noise, but confused since it didn't shatter. The shelf was 1.7 meters high, so I turned off the light, covered myself in a blanket, and went to sleep, hoping I could. The next morning, the doll was still on the ground face down. I started to think how it could fall. It was protected from wind, although there was none, and a 40 centimeter empty space in front of it. I got up shaking and slowly approached it. I sat on the floor and picked it up. It was intact, except for one thing. The left braid was cut in half, not torn, cut. I quickly put it away and never touched it again, nor even took a look at it. I still don't really know what happened. I tried to think it was my dad comforting me, but as I grew older, that didn't seem logical. Why would my dad, who loved me the most, try to hurt my favorite doll? I don't know what's been happening, but everything has been weird in our home lately. My cousin said it was probably a ghost joking, but it got me thinking. Everything in our refrigerator has been expiring and is full of mold. Nothing was supposed to expire until the end of next year. And yes, our refrigerator temperature is fine. It's 36 Fahrenheit. The dishwasher was full of maggots as well, which almost caused me to vomit. I've been hearing soft footsteps lately in the living room when I'm home alone. The walls are soundproof as well so it can't be my neighbors. And I have two cats, but they're always in my bedroom. Even my cats, for God's sakes, have been hissing and running away from the pantry when I open it. I removed all the bags and food, which caused them to get even more scared. This all started about two weeks ago when my mother brought antique dolls at the thrift store, which yes, I know is a stretch to even think they're haunted. And it might be a coincidence, 
but I'm not taking any chances. This might all have been something to do with those dolls. I don't really understand why this is happening now. I'm very uncomfortable in my own home. We can't move out. We can't afford anything like that at the moment. I just want to know what is going on. We were in my daughter's room going through the whole bedtime routine. My wife sat on the bed brushing my daughter's hair to put it in a braid while I stood around waiting to tuck her in and say goodnight. While waiting, I commented on a collectible 2010 holiday Barbie doll, still boxed, that was given to my daughter by our neighbor. I was curious to know if she had taken it out of the box, and my wife replied that yes, she did because dolls are meant to be played with. To that comment, I mentioned to my daughter that both her mother and I had collectible dolls tucked away in our closet, each of them still in boxes and never opened. These were a Bruce Lee action figure and a Jesse the Governor Ventura doll, and a 95th anniversary collectible Raggedy Ann doll. As I said this, my wife quickly corrected me and said no, that it's a Cabbage Patch doll that she owned, and that one of them would tan well. Having just reorganized my closet one day before, I was pretty sure it was a Raggedy Ann doll, but my wife swore up and down that she never owned such a thing. Curiosity got the best of me, and so I pulled the box out of the closet and brought it back to the room to show her. As I held it up, my wife stopped brushing my daughter's hair and slowly shook her head, and trying not to scare my daughter, mouthed the words, it's not mine. I've never seen it before. With a very serious look in her eyes. My wife has an incredibly sharp mind and a memory that sometimes terrifies me. So I know she wasn't trying to pull my leg. I asked if it might have been given to her by her sister, but a quick phone call confirmed that her sister had not. She once did, however, give her a collectible Mary Poppins doll, which both of them remembered. So, here we are now in our home, a doll for which we have no idea where it came from. I thought I had chills already running down my spine at that point, until I realized the doll was coincidentally the same as Annabelle, the haunted doll, which spawned horror movies and are now kept in the Ed and Lorraine Warren Occult Museum. It's probably nothing, but seriously, we freaked out. My wife, does have a Cabbage Patch Kid tucked away in another closet, but it's not this one. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories, a nice collection of paranormal, from haunted and cursed objects and dolls. I really like this topic. It's a shame that some people choose not to listen to this video. I'm not sure why, as it never picks up the views that others get. But still, I thought it would be fun to do. And uh, thank you to everyone who decides to check out Skillshare. The link in the description, first 500 get it for free. It really is quite good, guys. I do recommend it. You can learn so much. It's like free classes for two months. Try and make the most of it if you're one of the first 500. Really, it, it honestly is really good. In any case, I'd like to give a huge thank you as always to my lovely and amazing patrons for their continued support of the channel. It really means a lot, and for a small amount each month you can have your name at the end credits. Thanks guys. Alright then. Well for now, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.